turning your Bibles to Acts chapter 14. We're continuing, of course, our study of the book of Acts. It shows the history of the first century church, and uh, we're seeing Luke's account of the spread of the gospel message. And it starts in Jerusalem, goes through Israel, and into the known world. In fact, in Acts 13 and 14, we're seeing, of course, this, go ahead and put the slide up. Yeah, we're seeing Paul and Barnabas and the first missionary journey. They're going to what the region we call Galatia. It's modern day Turkey, but it's the same place that when you study the Bible and you look at the book of Galatians, these are the people that Paul wrote to. We know that Paul went on three missionary journeys. He went on the final trip to Rome, all recorded in the book of Acts. So we'll see them as we go through the book. There is this pattern, and we talked about it earlier, that they'll go to the city, they'll go into a city, they'll go to the synagogue, and they proclaim the message of Christ. And what we're seeing is usually as a whole, Jewish people as a whole reject, Gentiles as a whole accept, then there's usually persecution and problems and opposition, and they leave town and go to another city. And over and over we see the same thing. And when they proclaim Jesus Christ, it's what we see. Some people believe, some people reject, and opposition begins. And I think we're going to see the same thing in our lives. You go talk to people about Jesus Christ, there'll be some people who believe, there'll be some people who reject. And we see that uh, at great truth. Now, let, let me show you some things to think about as we look at the passage. First of all, how did God show the authority of, Barnabas, of Paul and Barnabas as we see this passage then? What was their emphasis? And then finally, what event shows the fickleness of people? I mean, that's what people are like. Sometimes they love you. The next thing you know, they hate you. And we'll see it as we go through the passage. Well, let's think about this. You know, we love sports, especially OSU sports and others as well, Thunder Games and pro and college and all of that. Um, Sometimes there's cheering because there's something good, and then sometimes there's booing because there's something bad. And it's so easy for one minute to be cheering for somebody, and then the next minute saying, how could they do that? I think of last night when right before the ball game between uh, uh, Auburn and Alabama, everybody's talking about Nick Saban. Oh, he's the greatest coach that's ever been. I mean, he's just, oh, everything is exact and perfect. And then at the end of the ball game, I think he makes two pretty big mistakes, so to speak, and everybody's talking about, how could Nick Saban do that? Could... So one minute they're saying he's the greatest coach that's ever been in the ball game. They're saying, what an idiot. What kind of play was that, right? There's a saying in sports that you're only as good as your last outing. One minute they're cheering you, the next minute they're booing you. Well, this morning we see Paul and Barnabas. They go to Lystra, and we see the people. One minute they're cheering them. In fact, they're actually wanting to worship Paul and Barnabas, thinking that they're gods who've come down from heaven. And then before you know it, they're trying to kill him. And we can learn from this not to put too much stock into what people say about us. But we saw that in the life of Jesus Christ. On Palm Sunday, as he came into the city, they were all shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The, name, the word Hosanna means save us. They're saying, save us. Best, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. These same people, just about four days later, are saying, crucify him, crucify him. This morning, we see Paul in his first missionary journey, the fickleness of the people as he goes to the cities of Galatia and proclaims the message. And what, one thing we see, whenever, whenever we present the good news of Jesus Christ, there'll be some people believe, there'll be some people reject, and there oftentimes there'll be opposition. Let me do this. Let me give you the outline of the passage just so you can see how it fits together. We're just looking at the first 20 verses this morning. Uh, it, the first part is in, is in uh, the city called Iconium. They have left Antioch, Pisidia, and they go to the city called Iconium, and we see many people believe, but there's opposition, division, and they run them out of town. So then they go to Lystra, and we see this healing, the rejection to the message, and then at the very end, what do they do? They, they actually think they kill Paul. That's their plan, is to kill Paul. So as we begin, let's remember where we are. Paul and Barnabas have been traveling through modern-day Turkey, the Galatian region. They went to a city called Antioch, Pisidia, and they proclaimed, uh, and a great number of people believed. I think, do we have the map up? Okay, let's put the map. You remember on the journey, they left Antioch. There are two Antiochs, Antioch of Pisidia, Antioch of Syria. They'd been in Jerusalem. Now for about a year, they'd been teaching in Antioch. Paul and Barnabas left. They went down to the island of Cyprus, went to Salamis, went to Palpus. They led some people to Christ. They went to Pamphylia. They landed at Perga and they went up to Antioch and they were there for a while and it was going good and they ran them out of town. So they're going to run them out of town and they're going to go over to Iconium and that's where they're going to be for just a little bit. We're going to see that before it's over they leave Iconium and go to Lystra. Before we let Lystra they go to Derby. Then they come all the way back and then they go back home. That's what we're going to see on this first missionary journey. So now they're in Iconium. Look at chapter 14. Look at verse 1. 
going, they're going to go into the synagogue, and as a whole, first of all, people are going to believe, but then we're going to see the Jews. And the Jewish people say, we don't want to listen to this, and we're going to see what happens. Uh, Acts chapter 14, look at verse 1. In Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed both of Jews and of Greeks. Now, that's sort of amazing. This is, they went into the, to the city. They go right to the normal thing, and that is go to the synagogue, and they proclaimed the message. Notice it says they spoke in such a manner. They proclaimed the truth, and what we know that they're giving the gospel. We'll see it in just a little bit. They're telling people that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. They're proclaiming that, and they spoke in such a manner that a large, notice, a large number of people believed. In this place, both Jews and Greeks believed the message of Jesus Christ. Now, here's what I want you to think about. Once again, we see the truth. The truth is that people believe. We want people to believe in Jesus Christ. We want people to trust in Christ as Savior. You know, people are confused about the message. The gospel is Jesus died and rose again. That's the good news message. The response is to believe in him for eternal life. And so it says here that a large number of people believe. That's the key. We want people to believe. For by grace you have been saved through what? Through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. It's not of works, lest anyone should ever boast. And so a large number of people believe, both of Jews and Greeks. So a large people believe. Now, let me, let me show you something. I, I, I've been thinking about this, and we, we see things like proselytes and Jews and Hellenistic stuff. Let me, let me show you who all these people are, just so you can get it. First of all, you'll see people called Hebrews. Those are Jewish people who live within the land of Israel, Okay. Then we'll see people call Hellenistic Jews. That's Jewish people, but they live outside the land. Then we see people called proselytes, and those were people who went to Judaism and actually believed in the God of Israel and were circumcised and came under the law of Moses. And for a man, this was a big step because you not only had to offer sacrifices and say you believed in the God of Israel, but you had to be circumcised. So they were called proselytes. Then there were some called God-fearing. Now these are Gentiles, of course. Gentiles who followed and said, I believe in the God of Israel, but I'm not going all the way. I'm not going to that thing. So they call those people God-fearers. So when you see the word proselyte, that means a, a man who said, I'm going all the way here. When you see god fear, it says, well, I'm not going that far, okay? Then you see what's just known as a Gentile. Gentiles were actually the nations. They were unbelieving, non-Jewish. So you've got Hebrews, Hellenistic Jews. You've got proselytes, which are Gentiles. You've got God-fearers, who are Gentiles. You've got Gentiles, who are unbelievers, and then you got the ones called Christians, first called Christians in Antioch. They are also known as the Way, with the ones who follow, whether Jew or Gentile, those who have trusted in Jesus Christ and the body of Christ. We call it the church, of course. So that's you, as you read through the Book of Acts, as you read through your Bible, you'll see some of these names. Just get you an idea of who these people are and how they fit together. Well, let's think about what we're seeing. We're seeing Paul and Barnabas going from city to city proclaiming the message. And we could raise this question. We're not going from city to city, right? We live here. So how many of us, day to day, as we go out in our community, are taking the message of Jesus Christ to people who do not know? Now, we're coming to a great time of the year because at Christmas and Thanksgiving and Christmas and all that, people begin to think about things and they get sentimental and they think about life and they think about their past and growing up. And we can talk about what is really Christmas about? Christmas is about the birth of the Savior. It's not just the birth of a baby. It's the birth of the Savior, Jesus Christ. And we can, we can proclaim that. Now, we got, if you notice, we got Paul and Barnabas. And I, I raised this last week. Have you ever wondered what Paul looked like? You know, I have this idea in my mind what Paul looked like until I found this guy, I found a writing, and it's in, written in the first century, and most believe that it's pretty accurate. It's a guy by the name of Onesiphorus of Iconium. He's a man who lived in this town, and he wrote and described Paul the apostle. Here's how he described him. He said, Paul was a man small in size with eyebrows that came together, a rather long nose, ball-headed, bow-legged, and strongly built. And then he says, and he was full of grace. Then he writes this. At times, he looked as a man, and then at times, he seemed to have the face of an angel. 
That's how Onesiphorus of Iconium described Paul the Apostle. So the next time you start reading through this, think about this little bald-headed guy by, uh, uh, with a big nose and eyebrows going all the way across. Uh, and, and that's, you know, Paul would say things. If you remember reading some of his writings, he would say, my bodily presence is what? Weak. But when I give the word of God, it is strong. That's what he talked about. So he was a great, great man. So in Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner with a large number of people. Both of the, the large number of people believed both of Jews and of Greeks. But now notice the opposition. But the Jews who disbelieved, stirred up the minds of the Gentiles, and embittered them against the brother. Now, there are those who disbelieve. Realize there is, there is no in-between, by the way. Understand this. Either a person believes in Jesus Christ and has eternal life, or a person is rejecting Jesus Christ. There is no in-between. Either we have eternal life or eternal damnation. There, people aren't sitting there going, you know, I'm kind of in limbo, and I haven't decided what I'm going to be. Listen, if you haven't trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, guess what? You're rejecting Jesus Christ as Savior. In John 3, 18, he that believes is not condemned, but he that believes not is what? Condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So, so there is no limbo of a person sitting there saying, I'll decide one of these days what, where I'm going to be. No, you, if you either trust in Jesus Christ as Savior or you're rejecting Jesus Christ as Savior. And so it says, but the Jews who disbelieved, they didn't believe the message. They stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. See, these Jews say, wait a minute, we... We got the message from God. You know, we got Moses. We got the law. We got the books. We're the ones from God. These guys giving this message out, we don't, we don't want you listening to this. This is what we see over and over. The Jewish people as a whole, when they rejected Jesus, they're rejecting the message. And so they don't want the Gentiles to believe. They said, no, 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 we're the right ones. Paul and Barnabas are not the right ones. And so the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the mind of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. And the word embittered actually means poisoned. It means poisoned their minds. They, they wanted them to think badly about Paul and Barnabas. Now, you remember last time when they were in Antioch, the city, and the people began to get after them? What did they do? What did they do? They left town, didn't they? Remember, it said they shook the, shook the dirt and the dust off their feet. And they came to Iconium. What happens now when there's opposition? Notice verse 3. Therefore they spent a long time there, speaking boldly, relies upon the Lord, who was testifying to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders being done by their hands. Listen, they stayed a long time. Now, we don't know how long a long time is. It could be six months. It could even be a year. It says they spent a long time there speaking boldly. Listen, they were not afraid to stand even in the midst of the opposition. And sometimes we let anything scare us off. We need to stand strong and understand we've got the greatest message of all time. It is a message of grace. It is a message of salvation. And we need to stand strong. And we need to continue boldly proclaim the message. What is the message? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through him. There is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we might be saved. They kept going. They were faithful. Look, uh, look right here in 1 Corinthians 4, 2. The key there is faithful. It is, it is required of stewards to be found faithful. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it says, Be steadfast, unmovable, all always a stand, a standing in the work of the Lord. So they, they just didn't let up. Now look what God did. They were speaking boldly with their upon the Lord who was testifying to the word of his grace. In other words, he was showing this was the right message because he granted signs and wonders. They were doing miracles. Now we've seen that before because Peter did miracles. We've seen that Jesus did miracles. The whole purpose of miracles was to show, to authenticate the message. Look, until the New Testament scripture was completed, God oftentimes used miracles to authenticate the messengers because they were coming in the name of Jesus. And somebody might say, well, how do we know to believe you? And they did miracles. And so it says signs and wonders were done by their hands. They, 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 they kept standing strong. But look at verse 4. But the people of the city were divided. Here's this whole town, this whole city, Iconium, is divided. Some sided with the Jews and some sided with the apostles. Now they're beginning to be a problem. Some sided with the Jews. Some, listen, whenever you proclaim the good news message, there will be some people who believe and there will be some people who won't believe. There will be some people who will say, I believe that. I, that, is, that is the message I've been waiting for all my life. And there'll be some people who say, I don't believe in this religious stuff. That's what they say. 
you understand. Listen to this. You may have never read these verses. This is second. You don't have to turn there. Second Corinthians uh, chapter two, verses fifteen and sixteen. Listen to what it says. We are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, we are aroma of death to death. To other, an aroma of life to life. And who is adequate for these things? You know what Paul is saying to the Corinthians? He's saying when you give the message of Jesus Christ to people, you're bringing them life or you're bringing them death. Because you're a aroma of life because you're telling them the truth of Jesus Christ. And if they trust in Jesus Christ, they have life. If they reject Jesus Christ, they have death. And he, Paul says, who is adequate for this? You have the greatest message of all. And so what happens? The people of the city were divided. And some sided with the Jews. Some sided with the apostles. Notice what happened. Verse 5. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and to stone them, they became aware of it and they fled. They fled to the cities. And we'll talk about it in a second. Of Lyconium, Lystra, and Derby and the surrounding region. Listen. All of a sudden, they found out that they were going to kill them. They were going to kill them because they stood for Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not sure, you, you can hold that for a second. I'm not sure that, that anybody has tried to kill me or you because we stood for Jesus Christ. Now, in some parts of the country, some, some parts of the world, I mean, they, they, they're people who stand for Christ and they get killed in this town because what Paul and Barnabas were doing, the, the whole city got divided. There was an attempt by the, both the Jews and the Gentiles with the rulers of the city to mistreat them and stone them. They were going to kill them. And so what did they do? Verse 6, And they became aware of it, and they fled to the cities of Laconian, which were Lystra and Derby and the surrounding region. Let me just show you on that map. They left... Iconium, and they went down. Actually, they're going to go to Lystra first and then the Derby. But he gives us the big thing. He says they went to Lystra and Derby, these, these towns. This is the Lyconian region. There's a language spoken by the people there, and we're going to see it. And so they left here, went to here, went to Antioch, went to Iconium. Now they're going to go to Lystra. After that, they're going to go to Derby, and they're going to come back through. So right now, they're getting run out of Iconium, and they're fixing to leave, and they're going to go to Lystra. But notice what it says. It says, and becoming a of it, verse 6, they fled to the cities of, of Laconium, which were Lystra and Derby, and the surrounding region. But look at verse 7. And they continued to preach the gospel. They continued to preach the gospel. Listen, uh, if somebody run me out of town, I'm probably going to go hide somewhere. Right? What did they do? They just went to the next place and they proclaimed the gospel. Now let's think about the gospel. The gospel message, of course, is that good news found in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. Paul says, For I delivered to you of first importance, which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried, and rose again the third day according to the Scripture. The good news message is the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is our message. When we go out this door and people say, What exactly do you tell people? You tell them that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for sins and rose again, conquering death. The death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now the response, which you want people to do, is you want people to believe in Jesus Christ for eternal life. John three sixteen: whosoever believes in him will never perish but have what? Everlasting life. So the response to the gospel is to believe in Jesus Christ. We're not telling people to believe he died and rose again. It's true. We want them to believe he died and rose again. But believing he died and rose again doesn't save you. Believing in Jesus Christ as your Savior is what saves you. Why do you believe in him as your Savior? Because he died and rose again for you. So there's a little distinction. One's the gospel. The other is the response to the gospel. We want people to believe in Jesus Christ who died and rose again. And it says they continued to preach the gospel. Now, they're going to go to Lystra. And Lystra is the next city along the way. We saw it on the map a while ago. And when they get to Lystra, watch what happens. In fact, I think let's throw the map back up. They're going to Lystra. See, they're going to stop there. And let's see what happens. Look, uh, by the way, Lystra was a Roman colony, very much like Antioch. Antioch is a much bigger city, but uh, Lystra was like Antioch. Now, at Lystra, they worshipped uh, Zeus and Hermes. Uh, there was actually a temple of Zeus at Lystra. Now, also, we can't see it here at all, but living in this town is a young man, and his name is Timothy. And his mother and his grandmother taught him the scriptures, Lois 
and Eunice. And we don't know whether they led him to Christ or when Paul came through here, he led him to Christ. But on Paul's second missionary journey, he picks this guy up named Timothy on the second missionary journey and takes him with him. We know him as the one that Paul writes First and Second Timothy to. So this is the hometown of Timothy. And so they go to Lystra. Look what happens. At Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. Well, they're going in there, and listen, it says this man was sitting there, and he had never walked, and he was listening to what Paul was saying. Look at verse 9. The man was listening to Paul as he spoke, when he had fixed his gaze on him, and seen he had faith to be made well, and said with a loud voice, Stand up right on your feet. Now, let me show you what happened. Paul was speaking. He saw this man who had never walked right there, it lame from his mother's birth, uh, from his birth, and, and he looked at this guy, and he saw this guy, and Paul knew, I guess the Holy Spirit told him, this guy believes he can be made well. And Paul said, get up. And the guy, he didn't just crawl up. It says he leaped up. Notice what happened. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke. Who? Paul, when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, stand up right on your feet. And he leaped up and began to walk. Now, let me show you this because sometimes people get confused. Notice it says that Paul saw that he had faith to be made well. I've had people say things like that if people had faith, they could be made well. I mean, there are reasons some people aren't healed and sometimes people get sick and die or some people can't do this. It's because they just don't have enough faith. You won't find that biblically at all. In fact, you'll find this, that in a number of places that we'll see that the one healing had the faith. That was Acts chapter 3. In other words, that was Peter. The one healed had the faith. That's one in Acts 14. But we'll also see that in one place, a bunch of friends had the faith that God could be healed. That's Matthew chapter 8. It doesn't have anything to do with who has the faith to be healed. It has to do with whether God chooses to heal a particular person or not. So don't let people say, well, if that person just had more faith, they could be made well or they could be healed. It doesn't work that way. Look what happened. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who when he fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he leaped up and began to walk. It's a miracle. Now, the reason we got this miracle, remember, is to point out that Paul and Barnabas are accurate from God. That's what it's supposed to be, that they're God's representative giving the message. What message do you think that this man had been listening to Paul say? What do you think Paul had been telling him? What do you think? The gospel, right? What is the message we see everywhere? What does it say back in verse 7? They continued to preach the what? The gospel. So when Paul was there, he's given the gospel. This guy listens to it. He may have already trusted Christ. We don't know. But Paul sees that he could be made well. And so Paul said, get up. And the guy got up. It's an amazing thing. Look at the reaction. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have become like men and come down to us. Well, here's a mistake. These people, when they see Paul heal this man, they think these two men must be gods. And they're thinking Zeus and Hermes, because that's the gods they worship. They worship Zeus. Zeus, their temple of Zeus is there. And so look what happens when the crowd saw what Paul had done. They raised their voices in Lyconian language. By the way, it's Lyconian language. Paul and Barnabas don't understand, do not understand what these people are saying. You know what they're saying? The gods are here. The gods are here. The gods are here. And Paul and Barnabas are going, what are they saying? You know what they're saying? I don't know what they're saying. What are they saying? And watch what happens. They begin calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Listen, they started calling Barnabas Zeus. That's their main god. Hermes is, is, their, is their messenger god because Paul was doing all the speaking. Notice this. I think the next slide has it. Zeus, the Roman name Jupiter, was their leading god who ruled the world. So they start calling Barnabas, who probably was older and looked like the leader, and they started calling him Zeus. And since Paul was the speaker and Mercury was also Hermes and Mercury were the messenger god, so they said, this must be Hermes because he's doing all the talking. This must be Zeus because he's the older man. And so they began to shout out, the gods have become men, the gods have become men, and we're all happy about it. That's what they're doing. And, and, and since, uh, I don't know, yeah, since Paul did the talking, they assumed Barnabas was Zeus and Paul was Hermes. 
Well, watch what happened. Verse 13, the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowd. Listen, Paul and Barnabas don't know what's going on. The people are shouting. They don't understand the language. They look up, and right at the edge of the city is here's this priest of Zeus coming, and they're coming with some animals, and they're fixing to offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas, thinking they're Zeus and Hermes. Well, what do you think Paul's going to think about this? Uh, they don't understand what's going on. And so look at verse 14. When the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard it, when they grasped it, when they figured out what was going on, they tore their robes and rushed into the crowd crying out and saying, listen, to tear your robe in that day and time, if you just regular clothes, if you took your clothes and you tore them, it showed that you were extremely upset. It showed that somebody was saying something that was really wrong. Sometimes if somebody blasphemed, they'd tear their clothes and say, you blasphemed. Do you remember? when the high priest told, asked Jesus, tell us the truth, are you the Son of God? And Jesus said, it is as you said, and you shall see me coming in the clouds. And the high priest, what did he do? He tore his robes. Now, by the way, it was forbidden for the high priest to ever tear his robes. So he disobeyed scripture when he showed that about about Jesus. But anyway, Paul and Barnabas tear their robes, and they rush into the crowd, and they say, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you. We, we're not gods. We're the same thing. We preach what to you? What does it say? The gospel to you. And that you should turn from these vain things, these false gods, to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea, and that's all that's in them. So when, when Paul said, they went in there and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, you got this wrong. We are not gods. We're talking about the true God. You, we've been telling you about Jesus who died and rose again. You need to turn away from these false gods and worship the true God. And they've been talking about all this. And, and that, that's the key. And, and, and what did they say to them? Listen, they said, listen, in generations gone by, God permitted all the nations to go their own ways, yet he didn't leave himself without a witness. In fact, that he did good, and he gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons and satisfying your hearts with good food, with, with food and gladness. See, God has always had his testimony in the entire world through the creation. Romans chapter 1, verse 20, God has made himself known through the creation. What Paul and Barnabas are saying to these people is, listen, there is a true God. We've been telling you about Jesus. Listen, God has always made himself known. Who do you think the one that gives you good food? Who do you think that brought the rains? Who do you think that gave you good crops? It's the true God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything that's in it. So they're telling them, turn away from these false gods. We're telling you the truth. And look what happened. Even saying these things, with difficulty, they restrained the crowd from offering sacrifices to them. They just could barely stop the people because these people, in their minds, were thinking that Paul and Barnabas were Zeus and Hermes, and they've gods who've come down to help them. And Paul and them are saying, no, 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 no. No, we regular people, we're telling you about the true God. We've been telling you about Jesus who died and rose again. There is a true God. You know who he is. He's the one that gives you the rains. He's the one that's giving you the food. He's a good God. Now, I want you to understand that at this moment, they want to worship Paul and Barnabas. But watch what happens in the next verse. But, but Jews came from where? From Antioch. That's, they ran them out of town in Antioch, remember? And Iconium. What happened at Iconium? They were going to kill them at Iconium. They ran them out of town there. And so some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. They came into the city, and they said, oh, these guys are here. Look, they were in our city, and they caused all kind of trouble. These guys are not gods. They're false teachers. Y'all need to kill these guys. And they got around them, and they, I guess we don't know what happened to Barnabas. Maybe he went and hid somewhere. But they got Paul, and they stoned him. Now, do you understand stoning? Stoning wasn't something, they just chasing somebody and hitting him with rocks. Usually stoning was throwing people in a hole, throwing boulders down on them and all of this. Anyway, they, they stoned Paul, and then what did they do? They dragged him out of the city supposing he was dead. Now I'm going to raise a question in just a minute that maybe Paul might have been dead. We don't know. But they, they came from Iconium, and they dragged Paul out of the city leaving him as dead. You know, you could say that when you got stoned, you could say that might leave a mark, right? I mean, think about it, right? Listen to this, Galatians six seventeen. This is the people Paul is writing to these people. 
From now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus Christ. What's he talking about? He's not talking about a cross on his arm. He's talking about the scars and the places where they hit him with the rocks and tore his face up and his arms and his hands and his back and his body. People would look at Paul and they'd say, what happened to you? He said, oh, they, I've been stoned several times. He was stoned several times. He was thrown in the ocean and almost drowned three or four different times. He was beaten with rods. If you read 2 Corinthians, he talks about all the things that he went through standing for Jesus Christ. Look what happened. But while the disciples stood around him. That, listen, if you're there and you're a believer and you're standing there, Paul is laying on the ground. And you know what you said? They killed him. They killed him. He's dead. He's not moving. I mean, how many people survive a stoning? But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. You can see him going, wow, that's tough. You know what? That's tough. That's tough. The next day, he went away with Barnabas to Derby. That's the next city on the list. And he's going to go there as well. The courage and the faithfulness of Paul. Paul was bold. He would not stop proclaiming Jesus Christ. They stone him and drag him out of the city. He gets up and goes right back into the city. Now, years later, he writes to Timothy. And I want you to see what he says to Timothy. But you follow my teaching, my conduct, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my perseverance, persecutions and sufferings such as happened to me. Where? In Antioch and at Iconium and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all, the Lord delivered me. This is Paul writing near the end of his life. He never forgot this. He writes to Timothy and says, Timothy, you've got to hang in there because you've got to stand strong because I had to stand strong. And there were things that they did to me at Antioch and at Iconium and at Lystra, and yet God delivered me. Let me tell you something. As long as God wants you on this earth, you're going to be alive on this earth. And you, it doesn't matter what he's got for you. As long as he's got you here, you're going to be here and you can stand strong. Now the question was, was Paul dead? I've got a thing I want you to think about. I think the slide says, 2 Corinthians 12 verses 1 and 2. Paul actually writes that there was a time that he was caught up into the heavens. And he saw things that God told him that he said, I saw things from God that I was not allowed to write about. When was Paul caught up into the heavens? Many believe that while he was stoned here, God took him there, gave him revelation, and let him live. We don't know. The passage says, supposing him to be dead. Maybe he wasn't dead. We don't know. What do you see about people here? Somebody may be your friend one day and may be your enemy the next day. Somebody you proclaim the truth through may love you. Somebody else you proclaim the truth through may hate you. Some people who one day are cheering for you, the next day are against you. Listen, the issue is not you. The issue is Jesus Christ. We're taking the message of Christ into a fallen world. We preach Jesus Christ, his death, and his resurrection. Whether people like us or reject us does not matter. What matters is the message of Christ. Well, we're going to see that they're going down and they're going to Derby. And he doesn't tell us very much about Derby, but he does tell us they go back through the cities. And we're going to see next week what they do when they go back through these cities that had run them off. We'll see what happens. Well, they've come to Iconium, and many believe there was a big division. They ran them out of town. They go to Lystra. They heal this man. People thought they were gods. They finally had to stop the sacrifice. Then people, the Jews came from the other cities and stoned Paul and dragged him out. And then they get back up. They go into town, and they leave the next day to go to Derby. Wow. Now, let me give you some applications, okay? Here they are. Let's be faithful to proclaim the gospel. Listen, A, know the message. Know the message. The message is the death and resurrection of Christ. Listen, if, I, if you had a test, if somebody gave it a piece of paper and said, write down the gospel, you should write down that Jesus died on the cross to pay for sin and he rose again conquering death. The gospel is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Know the gospel. And then if the next question was, what is the response to the gospel, what should you write down? 
to believe exactly right. Believe in Jesus Christ for eternal life. It is that simple. Don't add to it. Don't confuse it. We see it all the time. I pick up a book. It, you can't tell what the guy's message is. You can't tell what you're supposed to do. You pick up a pamphlet. You look at it and you go, it says four things you're supposed to do to be saved. I thought it was just faith. So be clear. We have the responsibility to be clear. B, look for the opportunities. Look for the opportunities. Don't let circumstances stop us from sharing our faith. Don't let circumstances stop us. Number two, expect opposition. You should expect it. We live in a world that's fallen. There'll be some people believe. There'll be some people reject. And oftentimes, there'll be opposition. I've told you this over and over. You can say God all you want to. You can say, I love God. And everybody say, oh, we all love God. Isn't God great? And everybody else say, God's great. You start saying Jesus Christ and him alone, you're going to make some enemies immediately. Expect opposition when you stand for Jesus Christ. We bring the message of life and death. Into the fallen world, the cross of Christ is offensive. To tell people they cannot save themselves, they can never be good enough to get to God, Jesus has done it all, and all they do is believe. Third, keep our eyes on Jesus Christ and not people. Run the race with endurance looking unto Jesus, because one minute people will be for you, and the next minute they'll be against you. First Thessalonians 4, 1, walk worthy of our calling. Live to please Jesus Christ. Now let me show you something. The key is not the messenger, that's us. The key is not the method on how we do it. The key is the message of Jesus Christ, that he is the one who died and rose again, and whoever believes in him has eternal life. That's the key. May we keep our eyes on Jesus, being faithful to proclaim Christ, knowing that there will be opposition to the good news, and some will believe, and some will not believe. 